that means she's ready to record. Yeah. Please take your seats, come on in, sit down. Joining us this evening on the piano is Jane Howard. Please rise for the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Just to give everyone an idea what the procedure and the role is going to be this evening, we're going to open up, we're going to go back into the regular town meeting, the annual, work on Article 51. If Article 51 is not done by the break, I'm going to declare the annual town meeting in recess and we're going to take up the special town meeting. We'll continue with the special until it's dissolved and then we'll go back to the next article on our list or back to 51. But we've spent three hours already on that. Um, I want to make a couple comments. Uh, on Wednesday evening there was what I, what I would consider some unfortunate ad hominem remarks. I myself engaged in it. I called Mr. Healy a loudmouth when he bellowed in. Mr. Healy, I apologize. I, um, I don't think anyone should be casting aspersions on anybody else. We shouldn't be directly attacking anybody else. This is a debate. It's not a, um, a schoolyard where we call each other various names or things. You should keep it civil and try to stay away from ad hominem remarks. And I would appreciate it if we could all do keep that level of civ civility. The other issue I want to bring up is the rule of the substitute motions and amendments to motions. When I insti that, instituted that rule when I first came a couple years back, what always had bothered me about town meeting was members would come in with these great big long substitutes and would try to explain them and their handwriting them, handing them to Mr. Warden, and none of us out there knew what was going on. That's what the 24-hour, one-meeting rule is meant to address. Major changes. Um, Mr. Good has put up what I sent to him the other day. You can all follow along and read it. Basically, major substitute motions, substantively amended motions. We want to get 24 hours in advance, the day before, so you all have it to read. We've all had our proposed votes of all the various committees for at least three, four weeks now. We've all can read them, we've all read through them. If you want to change something, by this point you know it. During the course of the debate, as happened the other night, Mr. Marr had an idea, he wanted to change something. The rule is not meant to stifle debate. The rules meant to advance debate if we all know what we're talking about. If someone wants to make a simple, straightforward change, which in my opinion Mr. Marr had wanted to do, and once I was able to read his handwriting, that's not an ad hominem remark either. <laughs> that was what my confusion was. I really I couldn't read and figure out what he was doing. Once I got it in legible form and I understood what he was doing, it was fine. Um, I've got several people have emailed me on the weekend over this. And I'm going to stick to the rule, but on main minor changes, 
uh, easily understood things, we're going to let them in. We're not here to ramrod through the recommended votes of everybody. We're here to have a debate and, and to figure out what's best for the town. And we can't do that if we don't allow simple amendments and changes at, on the fly. That's, that's why we're here as a legislative body, to do that. So I'm going to stick to the rule, but just remember, it's going to be up to me if we're going to let it, if I'm going to let something in. And I'm kind of strict about it. I'm, I'm not going to just let anything fly. It's whether or not I think you all can understand what it is and you're not going to be surprised by something. That's, that's my basic rule of thumb. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, are there any new town meeting members who have not yet been sworn in? I don't see any. Um, Ms. Rowe? Oh, your mic. Press the little button right at the bottom of the, uh, nope, up above, right at the top of the black part of the mic. There you go. Thank you. I was told I was speaking too loudly last time, so I was trying to moderate it. Um, it is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 11th, 2011 at 8 p.m. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Okay. Are there any announcements or resolutions? Madam? Oh, she beat you to it, mm -hmm. Harry. You're next to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Cindy Friedman, Precinct 8. I just want to let people know about a meeting that's coming up um, next Tuesday, May 17th. Um, Senator Donnelly will be holding a budget forum. Uh, it's called Massachusetts Budget FY 2012, Why Cuts in Services Should Matter to You. Um, it will be a um, presentation and a panel discussion including um, somebody from Mass Budget and Policy Center, uh, Dr. Thomas Garvey of Burlington Medical Association, is also part of the Department of Public Health, uh, Joan Butler, Executive Director of Minuteman Senior Services, and Harris Grumman, Massachusetts Political Director of SEIU. Um, we'll be discussing the FY12 state budget and um, protecting essential services. You're all invited. It's at um, the Cary Memorial Library. Um, large meeting room, lower level in Lexington, and it's for all um, Senator Donnelly's Lexington and Arlington constituents. I'll also put some of the flyers in the back. Thank you. Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. Uh, reports of my passing, uh, I'm afraid, were premature. <laughs> Uh, and uh, unwarranted and what that means is it's not in the warrant uh, I had to leave town in a hurry I'm sorry I missed uh, a number of meetings uh, only the second time in 50 years and uh, I really do appreciate uh, the calls that were made to my home and uh, the machine just jammed because of the overload and I will try to call everybody back that called. And uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. McCory. Uh, Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention a very small uh, item of news which occurred in our precinct uh, over the last year. Um, basically, Richard Briand and his brother Donald Briand, they live at uh, Fork Argyle Road. Uh, they actually uh, repaved a section of Dundee. They, got, they, they worked with a contractor, they checked with the town, and uh, out of their own pockets, they, they repaved a pretty ugly part of uh, Dundee, which you know, obviously uh, it um, abuts their, their property. But uh, I think it's Richard and Donald are seniors. I think it's worthwhile uh, publicly acknowledging them, and these are the kind of, these are the kind of things which make Arlington great. Uh, paid for it out of his own pocket. Uh, didn't thank, needed to get, uh, didn't ask for thanks. Uh, but I, I think it's worthwhile, uh, worthy if we uh, acknowledge uh, Richard, who's commonly known as Dick. Uh, uh, they're long, uh, a long-term resident of Arlington. 
And uh, he went ahead and checked with the, uh, the various authorities and went ahead and did it himself. So it's great. It's a big improvement to Dundee. It's the road which you head up into the Heights uh, opposite Trader Joe's. If you go up into Little Scotland, it's that first road. And if you, you'll notice the, uh, the sidewalk on the side is now has been, uh, it was last year, uh, very nicely repaved. So I just wanted to say thanks to Richard and Donald for that. Thank you. Mr. Costi. Just want to make an announcement for Wednesday. Um, next, the following Wednesday, or the next meeting on Wednesday, uh, the superintendent of Minuteman Regional School District will be here uh, probably approximately 9 o'clock ish. And uh, at that time, I'd like to uh, be able to take his budget out of order. Uh, and move his presentation. His presentation is on your seats now. Um, he's coming here after Belmont. Um, the superintendent has to go to 16 different town, special town meetings, so we try to accommodate him. But I just wanted to let you know he'll be here on Wednesday around 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Belkis, did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Uh, any other um, announcements or resolutions? Seeing none. Um, any report to committees? Nope. Okay, and that brings us back to 51. The next on the list was um, Mr. Oh, Mr. Marr is going to give us a 30 seconder. Can't even make the clock Thank you, Ms. Monterey. I'm not going to speak to the merits of the article, only to call your attention that on your chairs today uh, is the uh, slightly revised uh, amended motion that I so poorly presented the other night. Uh, the syntax has been cleaned up by the moderator, uh, and I want to thank other people, but they know who they are, for uh, assistance in crafting this in a little bit better fashion. The, the amendment is solely about giving us options. I think the selectmen put the cart before the, before the horse the other night, and when the, if you look at the main motion, it's, it assumes, it asks us to do too much. This is about options, sending it to a study, have the manager come back next year, and, and put the options before us. Options are good things in life. I just don't know why we wouldn't want to have that happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thielman was next. Somebody, oh, he's still here, good. Jeff Thielman, Precinct 12. I move the question in all matters under Article 51. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. I can't tell if it's two thirds or not. Uh, same tell. Is everybody in favor of term? Yes. yes. There was a second, Mr. G Judd. I can hear things differently up here. Everyone who wants to terminate debate, please rise. Same tellers. Mr. Schlickman? 16. Miss O'Connor? 27. 27. Mr. Tremblay? 31. Mr. McCabe? 25. 25. All opposed, please rise. Zero up front. Ms. Schlickman? 24. 20. 20. 14. 
15. It's not a two-third vote, it's 108 in the affirmative, 73 in the negative. Mr. Sir. He said 15. Harry, how many did you have? Oh, on the, on the eyes. Did, yes. 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 That's what I had, sir. Thank you. Yep. So 108 to 73, it is not two-thirds. Next on the list was Mr. Deist. First, I have a question, Mr. Moderator. Sir. The, uh, uh, John Dice, Precinct 13, and also a member of the Finance Committee. Uh, the article, as it's stated up there, is different from what we were looking at uh, last time. That's the actual warrant article itself. That's not the vote. I see. Yeah. Could, could, could we have the vote, please? Is, is, you don't have the vote. Okay. Yeah, we, we're not that far into the electronic age. We think we figured okay. that out before the meeting tonight. Well, I, I, I'm speaking to the vote. Um, as you may recall... The vote says re in your selectman's report under Article 51 right. where it says voted. Yes, in, in the selectman's report, Article 51. Um, as you may recall, I sp spoke earlier with re regard to some contentious snow removal issues and I attempted or I tried to urge us to try to get together and I'm going to try to do that to some extent tonight because I think there's a lot of polarization that's happened in the arguments that have occurred and also it's my opinion anyway that when the town meeting gets very emotional about something it doesn't do very wise things it does things, or it has the potential to do things that are not so wise. Whereas if we can be more logical, uh, then, then I think we do a better job. So I'm going to attempt to try to give you my logic about this article, as stated in the uh, Selectman's report. Uh, there seems to be a great deal of suspicion that the article is, in a, is an attempt to thwart the democratic process by which we vote for our, uh, some of our town officials. More alarming, in my view, have been some statements to the effect that this is an, this is an attempt to deprive citizens of being able to vote for those offices by bringing those offices under the, uh, under the manager. That is not at all how I read the article, and I'd like to explain my logic about the article. And I, I suggest that we look carefully at the article itself because that's the thing that we will be voting. In particular, the article states that the manager is to do research, and he's supposed to come back with articles to us in the next town meetings. Now, one might think that bringing articles forward is sort of premature in the sense that what we're trying to do is figure out whether or not we should do such a thing. I suggest that bringing articles forward is the very important mechanism by which we do the debate. And if we don't have articles before us, then there's no real significant basis for debate. We just sort of talk, you know, in, in a, a hand-waving fashion as opposed to having particular things before us to debate. So I suggest that the combination of research and articles will allow us in the next town meeting to do a deliberative debate process by which we can come to some kind of a useful conclusion. Um, this, this, the study itself, or the desire for the study itself, stems from the current process by which the town and the schools create the budget. And I'd like to speak 
from the point of view of someone who's witnessed that process for many years as a member of the school, uh, school member of the finance committee. The town, the town departments under the manager create the budgets for all of the town departments. And the school superintendent and, uh, and the staff of, and, uh, uh, and the supervision within the schools uh, create the school budget. And to a great extent, they're very independent processes. Uh, the town does its budget, the school does its budget. There's some interchange between the superintendent and the manager. And then it's really kind of up to the combination of those two people in many ways and their, uh, their aides and the finance committee to bring the two budgets together and finally, the school budget appears as one huge one, number 20, in the Finance Committee report. And it's more than half of our total budget. But be that as it may, the two processes occur separately. And they occur, as Alan Jones, the proponent for this article, has put forward to you in a quite inefficient fashion and more importantly, in my opinion, they occur in a way so that there is less chance to find mistakes in the process. And I would su suggest that in some ways it might have been possible to find the mistake that occurred last year that caused us so much difficulty. So this is a process by which the manager and his people and the school committee and superintendent and their people create these budgets. And the, the manager is asked to look at these two processes and try to figure out how to combine them. It's also important to understand that the elected officials have virtually no responsibility in, or role in this particular part of the process. They really don't do anything except in maybe a very peripheral way, in the process of creating those two budgets. It's the superintendent and the manager and their people and the finance committee that create those budgets. So what's being addressed here is that process, a process that has, and I don't mean this in a nasty way at all, relatively little to do with their treasurer. The treasurer has other very important things to do. His job is to bring the money in that will pay for those budgets, to pay the amounts of money that are allotted in those budgets. So here's, why, here's where I am trying to appeal to your logic. In that, the treasurer and other elected officials have relatively little or nothing to do with the development of these budgets. There is, there has arisen a what I would consider to be an illogical emotional process by which somehow people think that the voted officials and the process for voting those officials is threatened. And I submit to you that it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with this process by which these two budgets get developed and trying to make that more efficient. And having the manager come forward, as he will, I'm sure, in a very... Uh, uh, expeditious fashion next year with articles that we can argue is a perfectly logical and reasonable way to try to get at some of these difficulties that are associated with both the inefficiencies and the lack of, of uh, observability into what's going on in the budget processes. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tully? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Joe Tully, Precinct 14. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I, I found Mr. Peluso's remarks the other night uh, genuinely inspiring and wonderful, and I, I thank him for, for his remarks. I, I, you know, in my 18 years in the town meeting, I've heard nothing like it, and that's, that's uh, 
I, I think uh, we owe him a lot of gratitude for inspiring us thusly. Um, having said that, I, I hope I can be the manifestation of the sentiment that he expressed in his remarks, but I still stand here sometimes, or, or rather sit back there, um, and I scratch my head at some of the things that are said. I, I don't mean to necessarily um, to personally disparage anybody, but when someone tries to convince me that indicating our support for something is not the same as supporting that same thing, it, it strikes me as a, a bit of mental gymnastics that I think even if I were Mary Lou Retton, I probably wouldn't be able to accomplish very well. Um, some of us, some among us, I think, have trouble uh, appreciating why some others of us tend to sometimes be cynical or suspicious. And I would suggest that it's really that type of doth protest too much uh, commentary that, that sometimes uh, raises a red flag with us. Uh, so having said that, I would urge everybody to adopt Mr. Marr's uh, amendment. I think even if we are opposed to the, the article proper, putting it in a more palatable uh, fashion for us to vote on, I think, is, is a win regardless of, of how, how we uh, stand on the, on the underlying article. Uh, with respect to the article itself, I'd like to make a few uh, brief observations. I was privileged enough to serve on the 2005 committee that Ms. LaCourt referenced. I, I think it was 2005, it may have been 2006, and I know she um, referenced that she was a newly minted uh, select person at that time and in the ensuing five or six years she's since uh, changed her mind and, and that is absolutely her prerogative and I don't, I don't uh, begrudge her that. Um, however, I would like to let everybody know that that committee was comprised of some very uh, experienced individuals, some very thoughtful and intelligent individuals. We were a fairly uh, diverse committee and it was not a committee of inexperienced people that came to the conclusion that we didn't necessarily need to tinker with the, uh, the treasurer position or the other uh, finance, financial departments uh, as they're currently um, comprised. Uh, Mr. Foskett, who was a uh, finance committee member emeritus, uh, Jim Darty, one of our assessors and a longtime town meeting member, uh, Fire Chief Jefferson, who I think has been in town meeting at least as long as I have, and I'm certain he's been around town and um, involved with the fire department for, for much longer than that. Uh, myself, this is my 18th town meeting. I think it, it was around my 13th or so at the time when I served on the committee. Uh, John Billifer, our former treasurer of 30 plus years and a, a selectman for several years before that. Uh, town meeting member Alan Reedy, who's out there somewhere, was also on the committee, and I'm sure there are others who I have forgotten, so my apologies for that. Um, however, despite the diversity and the, um, uh, well, let's just leave it at our diversity, uh, we had a fairly broad, if not unanimous, consensus, uh, to the best of my recollection, and someone can correct me, maybe uh, Ms. LaCord has the, the vote committed to memory, I don't, but I thought it was nearly unanimous. Uh, it was near unanimous that the, the elected treasurer position works for Arlington, at least then. And that brings me to my next question, which is frankly, what has changed in that, that interim? Not that things can't change, but I don't know that anything significant has. Uh, I certainly support uh, efficiency and cost cutting. Um, however, um, I think as we try to move for another override, we certainly need to assure all the taxpayers that we're doing everything we can and we've turned over every stone and explored every nook and cranny to cut costs. I think if we don't do that, then um, our much needed override is certainly doomed to failure. However, I also believe that the elected treasurer position is a significantly important check and balance uh, for our system of government, and so if we consider this article, we need to uh, consider it against that backdrop and proceed very cautiously and carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tully. Um, Janice Weaver? Mr. O'Connor? Good 
Jim O'Connor, Precinct 20, uh, t 19. Um, <laughs> that's when I'm the election warden for the precinct. Um, the, <clears throat> the topic that we're discussing has really impressed me that there's quite a large amount of open debate, respectful thought sharing, and Mr. Caluso's remarks really impressed me in that there is a lot of divisiveness in this body, either between the front and the back, or the left or the right, or people that vote for or against. But I think what this debate has brought about is some discussion. Mr. Marr's substitute article certainly um, reduces my concerns about the initial motion that was brought before us, because last year, I asked the body about whether we were a resolution town meeting. That every time there was something said, we were asked to pass a resolution about our support. And I think that that issue that Mr. Tully already presented was that we're not being asked to offer our support until we fully debate and discuss the merits and the negative aspects of the issue. A couple of things that I thought about when I was listening to the various speakers before was an interchange back here about some sort of a negotiation about compromise. Every one of these articles, when the Board of Selectmen puts the warrant out, is for us. 252 elected residents of Arlington to debate. There shouldn't be, based upon the open meeting law, preconceived notions of how we're going to deliberate and what the final conclusion would be. In addition, as a tax consultant, I wanted to point out that I was very concerned about one of the remarks made last week about our treasurer. Whether it be our treasurer, our town manager, the boards, volunteer or not, we're all serving in a capacity to help this town. And one of the things that I don't see Mr. S Mr. Uh, Gilligan doing is just processing papers. I've had the occasion to confer with him in the office about rebonding some of the negotiated instruments to take care of the Sims property. And last year, under his initiation, he saved this town a lot of money. That is because when we were going to be considered for a new bonding rating, he, before the fact, was able to negotiate a reduced rate. I think we owe a lot of gratitude to our elected officials, and especially to all the volunteers that serve, especially even though some of them are cons compensated in a minor amount, the Board of Selectmen and all of the people here work together to make these issues happen. And I certainly think that our town manager, if you look at the budget, is $260,000 that we're spending for the assistant and the town manager. I would think we have an incredible think tank of resource there to come up with good ideas for how this town could save some money. And I do think that we need to enable them to discuss this, bring us some ideas, but I really like the fact that this debate is probably one of the longest ones that I've been at in the 15 years that I've been a town meeting member. And people are listening to each other, not terminating debate, and enabling a free and open discussion about what might be good for the town. I, I'm still um, listening to uh, the various ideas that are out there after Mr. Marr's proposal, removing words that say we support and ask the town manager to do something specifically. I really think we need to offer ideas, but the idea of supporting it before we know the answer, I think is way too soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gilligan, a second time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Precinct 13, Town Treasurer. 
Mr. Moderator, before I begin my remarks, I'd like to point out that I placed a memo on everyone's seat. Last Wednesday night, remarks were made ad hominem against me about my qualifications as treasurer. I'd like to set the record straight real quick. I hold an MBA with a concentration in finance, a degree in economics, certificates in public management, debt management, investment management, and contract management, and I'm a certified Massachusetts assessor. Those are but part of my qualifications, which I had prior to taking office. And again, Mr. Moderator, I was elected three times as treasurer. Mr. Moderator, it is obvious to anyone watching last Wednesday's debate that once again the Board of Selectmen have managed to initiate an action that divides Arlington. It was equally obvious that the divisiveness that was so aptly pointed out by Mr. Peluso was generated by the deep distrust that many of Article 51's opponents have of the motives, objectivity, and manner in which Article 51 was proposed. A point of clarification is in order regarding the potential impact of this article on the overall town budget. Depending upon the number of personnel and departments that are included in the category financial, these departments, assessors, comptroller, and treasurer, account for barely 1.5% of the total budget. In the case of Article 51, town meeting is expected to accept without question that the town manager, who clearly stated his preference for a consolidated finance department, would objectively prepare an implementation plan that is thoroughly researched, properly designed, with clear lines of authority and responsibility for the proposed consolidated finance department. Town meeting is further expected to believe that this consolidation and promised job reductions will be equity, equitably applied and not serve the self-interest of the town manager and the board of selectmen. We have all the experience, we have all experienced that, or, the, that particular organizational moment when we realize that a predetermined outcome by a boss or a powerful interest group has eliminated any hope for a rational plan and that a ve very poor idea will continue forward. Town meeting is at that moment where it needs to recognize that nothing of value will come from a Warren article like Article 51 that has so many conflicting instructions and goals and has generated so much conflict. It's been stated, appointed officials. Mr. Moderator, we should defeat Article 51 in all its forms. Mr. Moderator, I ask that um, John Billifer, resident of the town and former town treasurer, be granted the opportunity to speak, and he's requesting five minutes. Um, he's got the remainder of your time. She didn't request it up front. So if he wants to come and use your last two minutes, he better move it. Is he here? Where? Mr. Billifer, you going to use his time? Okay. Hey, Sean, what's going on with all those chairs back there? There's a reason there aren't chairs back there. It caused dissension in voting ranks. Mr. Moderator. Yes, sir. Uh, those who know me know I never could do anything in two minutes. Uh, I have some remarks that I think will take about five minutes. Could I have five minutes? Well, it's up to the will of the meeting. Is there a request for him to have five minutes? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? <clears throat> well, you got five minutes. Thank you very much. After speaking with you last Wednesday evening, I re Oh, John Billifer. John Billifer, what's your address, John? John Billifer, uh, I'm the chairman of the retirement board, former treasurer, and I live at 15 Victoria Road, Arlington. After speaking with you last Wednesday evening, I remained in the town hall to listen to the continuing debate on this article and was impelled as one who has served Arlington's as Arlington's treasurer for 33 years to speak a second time in order to take issue with some of the conclusions drawn by the proponents of Article 51. Frankly, I was taken aback, as were some of you by your reaction, to Mr. Tosti's characterization of elected officials as being unqualified amateurs, and that no qualified person would leave their job to run for the office of treasurer. The background and qualifications of elected treasurers over the past 60 years is in direct contrast to, the pes to this pessimistic assessment. My predecessor as town treasurer, Fran, Coughlin, a Harvard graduate, 
left a financially secure position to run and be elected in the 1950s and served for almost 20 years before being appointed a senior vice president and head of the municipal department of a major Boston bank. I am also a Harvard graduate with undergraduate degrees in American government and economics, a law degree and a master's degree in finance, who gave up a law practice in 1972 when elected treasurer after serving eight years as a selectman. Mr. Gilligan has told you his qualifications, uh, and he holds a, major, a master's in business administration degree with a major in finance, as well as certificates of achievement in, in numerous related fields. As far as the prospects for future candidates for Arlington Treasurer are concerned, I strongly believe that there, there are qualified individuals living in Arlington interested in public service as a career who would compete for this office, particularly during this period where the pension and health benefits in the public sector are in many instances superior to those in private sector corporations. As I see it, the key area of controversy in this discussion regarding an elected versus an appointed treasurer lies in the definition of whether the job is administrative or whether it has policy implications. The proponents of this article continuously refer to the town treasurer as an administrator rather than a policymaker. They seem to believe that if they say this often enough, people will eventually believe it. Policy is defined in Webster's Dictionary as a course of action pursued by an elected official on behalf of his or her constituents, whereas an administrator works for and is responsible to his or her boss. I recall when I was first elected treasurer in 1972, someone suggested that I could sit back, see that the money was collected and accounted for, and I would have the job for life. My reply was that I didn't run for the job to be a bean counter. I believe then, as I do now, that as an elected official, I was in a position to influence financial policy in the town of Arlington. And I believe I had an influence on financial policy when I filed and had enacted legislation to establish a first in the nation municipal tax checkoff scholarship fund. And I believe I influenced financial policy when I filed and had legislation enacted allowing Arlington to commence funding its enormous pension liabilities, a program that over the years has stabilized Arlington's, Arlington's pension appropriation and freed up funds to be used for other purposes. And I believe that Steve Gilligan influenced financial policies when he brought forward a plan to convert the Sims Hospital bond anticipation notes to permanent financing at more favorable interest rates. During this discussion, a big deal has been made about the lack of communication and coordination of Arlington's financial affairs. This lack of communication would quickly disappear if the Selectman Finance Committee and Town Manager would forget about trying to control Arlington's finances and begin treating the Town Treasurer as a policymaker rather than an administrative bean counter. When the Town Manager Act was established in the 1950s, the drafters of the act made sure that Arlington's town manager would have complete authority and control over the departments he administered. To offset that authority and control, the drafters of Arlington's act made sure provisions were included that acted as a check Time's and balance up. on the manager's power through an elected town treasurer, town clerk, and board of assessors. Almost done. I'll just wrap up by saying when voting on this article, I would ask you to think long and hard before disrupting this separation of powers by allowing this study of an appointed town treasurer to move forward, I suggest that you vote no on Article 51. Thank you very much for allowing me the time and listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Judd. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. Mr. Moderator, could you tell me roughly how many people have already spoken and how many more wish to speak? Because this is, I think we're setting a record here. Um, generally, it's against my policy to do so, but the list now... 
I have 70 people, about half of them have spoke. Well, I think that proves one thing, that there's 70 some odd people besides myself who wish to uh, happen to say anything about what's going on with this article. I tend to think that uh, this is not going to be an easy way to meld that together. I think both sides seem to be fairly well set in their idea of how things should or should not be. Uh, I just asked for a show of hands. Does anybody remember Carmen Foratano? I'm the one who takes votes. Please listen, no. listen. I said I would like to know if anybody remembers Carmen Foratano. Now, mostly people who are much older here. He was the last elected auditor, if I remember correctly. Appointed? I thought he was elected, Carrie. Okay. Well, as I say, that's a long time back. And I'm wondering if we had an auditor with a little more authority that perhaps the problem of the school budget wouldn't have arisen because the auditor would have known to warn the various officials that they couldn't do it that way. Whether that would have made any difference, I do not know. However, I feel certain that we will not be able to come to very much of an agreement on this article, even with the uh, help of Mr. Marr's correction of some of the problems with the article. And I think I don't want to see this town meeting get too divided, because there are some, well, I think, pretty strong feelings on both sides. I don't think we want an appointed treasurer or anybody else, but I would like to see some concrete proposals, not general, well, this is what we want to do, but it's like putting the cart before the horse. And I would rather, if possible, try to find a way that both sides will be satisfied and nobody will thought, think they lost. Everybody will be a winner. Therefore, I move no action. With a no action movement, I believe that the, nobody can feel that they lost. There hasn't been a recorded vote. And it's a go to back to the drawing board is basically what no action would mean. So, Mr. Moderator, as I say, my, uh, my would like to move no action on this article. Are you making a substitute? Uh, will will that hear me out? Uh, a substitute motion for no action. Is that what you're doing? Yes, sir. Whatever you think is a proper form. No, I'm just asking you what you want to do. You want to make a substitute motion for no action. Yes, you, you I want to get someone to second that. Yes. Sir, Mr. Marr, what's your point of order? I agree with you. I, I'm in agreement with you. We've no the the the, shh. the point I, is that if we vote it down, it's no action automatically. We don't have to actually do a substitute for no action. Yes, I understand that, but I think no action possibly would leave a few less people, uh, shall we say, disturbed by what went on. Uh, and uh, according to the, my memory, and I've been here since 1972, with two years of exception, any time an article was brought before this town meeting or before any board or committee, that. if the article either was not properly I descriptive point. or seemed to be defective or nobody was for sure what the article meant, usually that body would suggest a vote of no action. That is why I'm suggesting it, because at the moment, I believe that this article, either no matter how well Mr. Marr has tried to uh, correct it, I think that there are still too many defects and too much suspicion. I would rather see a no action vote than just a straight up or down vote because I don't think that's going to be, this would be a, shall we say, a graceful way to get over with this thing. So I, as I say, that is my uh, thought, but no action, even though, as Mr. Marr says, if we turn down the article, but I think if we vote no action now, or soon, if, we, if ever, well, that, you, that we'll... You, you, you can technically make the motion for no action, and to, mm -hmm. as a substitute, but it's not going to make anybody feel better if they lose. 
Right. Well, if I'm we not tell sure. If we the no action to what we've been debating for I am not four sure hours, if it will or really won't. I don't point. But if I'm not, as I say, I, Mr. Moderator, I'm not sure if it will or it won't satisfy it. everyone, but I'm, I would I'm rather see the, uh, it that way. From, from the moderator or emeritus, I'm getting the no, you can't do it nod. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, I would like the amended motion to be voted first before we do anything else. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put you on the list, Mr. Peluso. The next um, on the list was Mr. Wagner, who, if he's in his traditional spot, isn't here. So, sorry, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Kleinman. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. Move the question on all matters related to this article. Okay. We have another, another motion to terminate debate. We we'll call this one T3. All in favor of terminating the debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. That's two thirds. <laughs> um, not that we should be happy. We, we've done a very good job of debating this all sides. So we're now going to take um, a series of votes. First before us is going to be Mr. Mars' substitute, which you should all have in your chairs. And it should all be clear to you what he's doing. And is there any question on what his vote is? Seeing none. All in favor of Mr. Mars' substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. In my opinion, it is an affirmative vote. I, we have five, five people rising. So we're going to take a voice, folks. We have five people rising. All in favor of Mr. Maher's amendment, please rise. Ms. Mahan, up front. 11. 11 in the affirmative, up front. Mr. Schlickman, how many on the left? 25 on my left. Mr. O'Connor? 46. 46. 46 on the left center. Mr. Um, Tremblay? 34 in the right center. 34. Mr. McCabe? 33 on the right. All opposed to Mr. Mars' amendment, please rise. Ms. Mahan, how many up front? Zero up front. Zero on the negative up front. Mr. Schlickman, how many on the left? 17, 17 on the left. Mr. O'Connor? Four. Four. Mr. Trembley? 14. Mr. McCabe? Nine. One hundred forty nine in the affirmative, forty four in the negative. It is approved. We now have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended and substituted by Mr. Mars' vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. It's, it was very close. I'm going to call it as a no vote. I'm going to say it's a negative. All right, we have five people rising. We are rise. Everyone who is in the affirmative for the main motion, as substituted by Mr. Marr, please rise. All in favor, please rise. Same tellers. As substituted.
Sir, these people don't understand what we're doing. What we always do every time. We've substituted Mr. Myers' vote for the um, Board of Selectmen vote. Now we're voting on the main motion as substituted. Yeah, it's, if you want Mr. Myers to become law, you're going to stand up and vote now. I hope that's what you all did. <laughs> do we have to do it again? Uh, what do you think? All right, Mr. Tremblay says yes. Everyone who wants Mr. Mars amendment to be the main motion and they wanted to do it. All right. All in favor of the as substituted by Mr. Mar. I mean, how else can I say it? I have to say it that way. Everyone in favor of the amendment, please rise. They, they're all confused. That's what I said, I thought. All in favor of the main motion as amended, please rise. That's what I said, I thought, three times. Diane? Eleven. <laughs> Two little skinny chicken legs. Mr. Schlickman? 19. 19. Mr. O'Connor? 41. 41. Mr. Tremblay? 31. 31. Mr. McCabe? 26. 26. All opposed to the amendment, please rise. Zero up front. Mr. Schlickman? 24 to left. Mr. O'Connor? 10. Mr. Tremblay? 17. Mr. McCabe? 18. The final tally is 128 in the affirmative, 69 in the negative. Motion carries. No, we don't want to roll call for it. Yep. All righty then. We're going to declare the annual town meeting in recess. And we'll, Sir, what purpose do you arise? Are you, you're considering no, serving notice on reconsideration. Very good. Hold on. Oh, yes, sir. Did you vote on the prevailing side, sir? He did. Yeah, that was Mr. Deist. I got to get that for the record. Okay, we are now declaring this annual town meeting in recess, and that brings us to the special town meeting. I uh, recognize the chairman of the board of select in this row. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I have a new duty, I see. I'm going to read um, the warrant. It is requested that the members of the board of selectmen and elected officials of the town Town manager, department heads of the town yeah. okay. and staff, superintendent of schools and staff, committees, commissions, and boards of the town, Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District Committee and superintendent, members of the general court representing Ar Arlington and also any consultants who have been retained to work for the town relative to the to articles to be acted on by this meeting, representatives of interested parties of Article 2 and representatives of the news media be permitted to sit within the special town meeting enclosure. Second. All in favor, please say yes. 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 So moved. Um, 
Madam Town Clerk, do you declare that the special town meeting has been duly called and that you have the constable's return of the warrant? So she says yes, she does. Ms. Rowe. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 11, 2011, at 8 p.m. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No. Okay. Article 3, any reports of committees? Do anybody, anybody have a report they want to submit on this? The selectmen and the finance reports are already before the committee, I, before the town meeting, I believe, from when we took them earlier. Any other reports of committees? All right. Um, that, yes, sir. Where are these located? They're located in the back of the selectmen's report. Oh, the finance committee. I thought the selectmen had some too, didn't they? They're all in the back of the finance committee report. I thought they reported on one. They did. They're in both. Okay. Um, article 2. Ms. Rowe. Did you find them? Page 25. Page 25. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Town Moderator. Yes, Mr. Moderator. I'd like um, Christine Conley to come up and um, speak under this article. Thank you. Christine Connolly, Director of Health and Human Services. It's not on? You have to just get a little closer to the mic, Christine. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, you cannot. Can you now? Okay. Thank you. Um, so what you have here before you this evening is uh, an amended uh, 2011 budget for the Arlington Youth Counseling Center's uh, Enterprise Fund. Um, there had been uh, last year... Sorry, I guess people cannot hear me, so I will speak up. Last year, town meeting voted to uh, cut back some funding to the Arlington Youth Counseling Center, uh, which prompted the agency to reevaluate the way services were provided. So we uh, hired a consultant to assist us with evaluating uh, the agency, and we implemented a FIFA service-based counseling model. So we went from town staff providing mental health counseling to youth, youth and families to hiring FIFA service clinicians who we pay per session. We then developed contracts with the health insurance companies, uh, including Mass Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Tufts, Harvard Pilgrim, uh, and we bill insurance for each session that's provided. Uh, as a result, um, we had to amend the, the budget for FY11, uh, which you have here before you. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Does anybody wish to address the article, Mr. Jameson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, first, I have a question for Director Connolly. Um, how has this impacted the services that you provide, Christine? Ms. Connolly, has there been an impact on your services? Christine Connolly, Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, it has actually improved our services. We're able to now offer more counseling to more youth and families. Last year, we had a, a significant uh, wait list of youth and families needing services. Uh, and this year, it's been significantly um, covered by our FIFA service clinicians. We've been able to hire uh, clinicians as we need them. So currently, we have, I believe, 16 youth on the waiting list, as opposed to last year, where we had over 40. And would you make any other comments about this change that you might wish to make? Good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, we have been doing very well. Um, we have recently uh, begun our fundraising campaign. So many of you might be seeing that out there. Um, we've started writing grants and looking for foundation funding. So we're really looking at alternative ways to uh, fund this agency. Thank you. Um, and I have a comment on the, on the type of uh, warrant article that was put in here. 
Um, this is something that I believe, um, amendments to budgets, this is something that many towns put in their warrant, their regular warrant, each and every year. I believe that this was something that was proposed uh, previously by perhaps the Vision 2020 Physical Resource Task Group. I think this is a good housekeeping uh, uh, article that the Finance Committee and the Town Manager should consider inserting in every year so we don't have to have a special just to do this. Thank you. Mr. Deist. John Deist, uh, member of the Finance Committee, uh, also town meeting member from Precinct 13 and on the subcommittee, along with Mary Margaret Franchelmont, uh, within the Finance Committee overseeing youth services. And I just want to say that uh, she and I, and I think I can speak with you, for you, Mary Margaret, if you're here, she and I are very, very pleased with the way that youth services has evolved over the last year. I think the manager and Christine Connolly have done a, a wonderful job in creating a stable organization that has funding to do its job and, and, and is, uh, if anything, a great, an enormous benefit to, to the town and maybe even an enormous benefit to the whole region because these services are sort of only available in many ways right here in Arlington and paid for as well in many ways from people's insurance as opposed to being subsidized as it was the, as was the case in the past by the town. So it's a it's a win-win all the way around as best I can tell for Arlington. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Dyson. Mr. Judd Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. <clears throat> I'm just curious as to one section here. It says total increased revenues or increased revenues, 118,357, which happens to total, coincidentally balance the total increased expenses. I'm just curious as to where this money came from. I would like to know if maybe we just collected more revenue than it was expected. I would also like to thank the moderator for not having a vote on my amended motion and thank him for allowing to Mr. Marr to interrupt while I was speaking. Other than that, I think that this, uh, I would just like either the Finance Committee or someone else you to just explain speech? where this money was dug up from. Ms. Conley, do you know where the money came from? Christine Connolly, Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, we began billing health insurance companies at a much uh, higher level this year. That's where you're going to see the, the additional revenues coming in from. And the additional expenses are the FIFA service clinicians, which we hadn't built into the budget uh, when we prepared it last January. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all matters in this article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's terminated. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Finance Committee is printed in their report. Please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, so declare. Number two. That brings us to Article 3. We have before you the recommended vote of the FinCom. For Arlington High Rehab, someone want to talk about that? No, oh, Mr. Sullivan's going to tell us about it. Yes, the town maintains a municipal buildings insurance fund to cover any losses uh, to property damage um, that are not insured. Uh, we have a hundred thousand dollar deductible on our policy, so that's what that uh, fund we maintain uh, is there to cover. Uh, we did have a uh, burst pipe at the high school this year, which caused uh, some significant damage uh, beyond our deductible. And uh, we're looking to transfer $92,000 uh, from that fund in order to cover those uh, damages. Be glad to answer any questions anyone has about that. Mr. McCabe. 
Uh, question has been made. Have the repairs been made? Have you, you got to get up uh, and announce? Not completely yet, but most have. Anyone else wish to address the article? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended vote, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote. So we declare. That brings us to Article 4. Mr. Tosti. Mr. Foskett, who is chair of the Capital Budget Committee um, and a leading part in uh, both Articles 4 and 5 is out of the country on business. Uh, and I think he, it would be critical to hear from him on both of these articles along with the capital budget because they're all interrelated. Therefore, I w would move to postpone Articles 4 and 5 to the 6th, May 16th, which is next Monday. All in favor of postponement, please say yes. Yes. Okay. Opposed? No. They so po postponed. Mr. Tossi, I, I only have a recommended vote of no action on number four. Is there another vote? No, but he's going to speak to that because we have to take... Okay. Please, uh, yeah. There's going to be action taken in the capital budget, which is in the annual town meeting, and that action will make action on Article 4 in the special not needed. Okay. And I think it's important for him to be there to explain those elements. No, we postponed it. I just was wondering if we could expect something else. Okay, so six, five, and six are postponed to five, four and five. Okay, the 11th and next month, the 16th, right? 16th. Five, 16. That brings us to number six. Joe Tully. Oh, let me tell me it's a break. No, it's 15 minutes. Yeah, it's number. Someone want to speak to it? Number. Yeah, someone's got to get up and introduce it. Yes, Ms. Brody. Good evening, uh, Kathleen Brody, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you for allowing me to speak to this particular article. Uh, we had um, two invoices from arbitrators for work that was done during the FY09 year. However, they did not submit their invoices to us to well over a year after they rendered their services. And after the time that the books had closed on FY09. Um, so the purpose for this um, article tonight is to have funds available in order to uh, close out these invoices. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Mr. Tully. Joe Tully, Precinct 14. Um, I apologize to Dr. Bode. I missed the first few uh, words of her commentary. Uh, did you indicate who we're paying pursuant to this article? The names of the two arbitrators? These are for payment to arbitrators, is that? These are paid to okay. arbitrators. And I understand the article itself says what it's not related to. Is there, is there anything you can tell us as to what it is related to? Certainly I don't want to just, I don't want to know specifics of personnel issues, but can you, is this a staff grievance? Is this are, a these, IEP issue with a student and its These family? are both staff grievances. And do we send out notices to our vendors to ask them to pay us before the end of the fiscal year? I, this is the first time I recall doing this. So I imagine in the absence of some sort of notice, we would be doing this every single year. Uh, how do the vendors generally know to pay us? Well, or, or I'm sorry, the, how do our service providers know? In the, in the, uh, for arbitrators, they submit their invoice through the AAA, which is the American Arbitrators Association, which was the case um, in both of these. And the, they also at the same time submit their invoice uh, to us. Um, generally speaking, arbitrators usually submit their invoice almost immediately upon um, submitting their decision. 
it was quite unusual, in fact, to have two arbitrators, uh, two independent arbitrators, submit their invoices so late. No, we don't send notices out to vendors saying, please pay us. Generally, what we do is if we have please somebody that has um, had a, um, we, we encumber invoices, but then there comes a certain point when the books for that year are closed out. And then if that invoice or a payment comes forward, we don't have the ability to be able to, to pay it. Uh, thanks. I, I did have one other question which you answered in the scope of your, your comments. My only other question I guess would be directed to the town council or through the moderator or anyone else who I guess is deemed appropriate to answer. What happens if we don't vote by 90% in favor of this article? I assume just these people just don't get paid. Do we send them a letter saying, I'm sorry, town meeting didn't authorize the payment? Um, Ms. Rice, what would happen if we don't vote to pay these folks? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. If we Shh, quiet, please. Ms. If Rice Town Meeting doesn't authorize uh, this payment, then no, these folks are not only won't get paid, they cannot get paid under the law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kleinman. Oh. Kleinman. Oh, Lyman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. There's something that's terribly wrong here. Um, I used to have a job where I worked with contractors, and there was a clause in the contract that said if they didn't bill within 30 days, then they weren't, wouldn't get paid. I actually had a contractor that billed me six months later, and she wasn't happy because we did not pay her. I don't know if we have any such clause in any contract with the school department, but for somebody to bill, this, we're almost at the end of fiscal year 11. That's two fiscal years away, and all of a sudden we're talking about paying a bill from fiscal year 09. I think, I think it's, frankly, it's too late. If somebody did not bill before then, didn't do due diligence for their own work, that's their problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you want to answer to, did you have a question embedded in there or no? Thank you, thank you. Well, one is, do, do, we, do we have a clause in a contract which, which gives a time limit for billing? Dr. Bode, do you know if there's a, such a clause in your contracts? We don't have contracts per se with arbitrators. When a, 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 a particular case goes to the AAA, um, they, there's a process by which arbitrators are selected. And um, I'm not aware of any clause to that effect. Last year, the reason why it's an FY11 coming before you is we didn't even get their bills until um, I think late May last year. Um, so it wasn't possible to put it forward into a special town meeting uh, for last year. I understand, but my point stands that they would know, any arbitrator or anybody would know the fiscal year ends on June 30th and would know to get the bill in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Romano? I'm a little confused. Is there a contract, a set rate for every arbitrator? I mean, do we know how much we're going to pay them before Fourth, they arbitrate? Uh, well, I don't know. I actually, all we're talking about now is $4,207. Arbitrators probably have a set fee per hour. I'm getting a nod yes. And did you know what the rate was prior to entering into arbitration? I guess what I'm asking yeah, is I'm how many sure hours did. are we paying for? What period of time are we paying for it? And as Mr. Kleiman said, there should be a restriction as to submitting a bill late. And I'm just curious to what the hourly rate is for an arbitrator. Ms. Dr. Bodie's going to give us an answer on that. Uh, for an arbitrator, it is based on about $1,200 a day, but that includes um, their writing of the decision and doing the research for the decision. Um, so it's what they charge is simply for their presence during the day of the arbitration, and these were two-day arbitrations, both of them. Okay, I have one more question. Um, I think it would have been easier for us to absorb this if in this warrant it said time from April 10th to April 21st 
we had an arbitrator who had to be paid this amount of money. There should have been a set contract that we could look at so that when a bill came in, we can verify that the contract is equal to what he's asking for in payment. And I don't see any of this in a warrant. I just see a lot of words. We, and we I'm not comfortable with a, that. We well. don't have an independent contract with the arbitrator. That's not how the process works. It goes through the American Arbitration Association and gets referred to um, through, the, through the process of the grievance process with the MTA. OK, so there's no accountability. I just find it hard as an independent contractor myself to not have in writing a contract with a said person that I'm going to give you my time, my professional time, and this is what it's going to be, and I will bill you for such fee. So I'm having a hard time with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Judd? Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. To follow on with uh, Ms. Marino, I have a simple question. If the, this is the way the American Arbitration Association runs their business, should we be doing business with them? I also have a triple A card, but that's just for towing my car. I, really, I believe that ob obviously we're morally obligated to pay this bill, but I think the payment should include a rather, shall we say, terse letter telling them exactly what kind of problem they have caused for the town and that they are darned lucky that we're paying them. And I think that the American Arbitration Association could, should get the same letter. Plus, I hope we will make sure that we never hire either of these two arbitrators yeah. again. Okay. Other than that, well, nothing. Okay. Mr. Ciano. Hopefully he's going to terminate. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, a couple of, couple of questions. Name and, name and precinct. Oh, Frank Ciano, precinct uh, 15. Uh, if we... If we do not pay these two arbitrators, uh, query, uh, won't they bring suit? And won't the suit then cost us more than the 4000 we've got to pay them? Uh, well, technically, we're talking. Otherwise, we're talking. I'm going have the floor, Mr. Judd. We owe them 4200 bucks. The contract probably are obligated to do it within a year. I think they sent us the bill a year ago. And we just haven't been able to bring it up until now, so we're both kind of like been holding bills for a long time. Yes, they may sue us, and we'll have Juliana go down and defend the lawsuit and get it dismissed after 10 hours of her time. So you were right, and it would get dismissed in the end. Does that answer your question? I guess so. Thanks. Thank uh, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamerson, Precinct 12. A uh, question was raised about contracts. I do a lot of work in my business on purchase orders. They can be four, five, ten, twelve thousand dollars. Just I tell people to do work, they bill me. Bigger things, I have a contract. Um, on, on the idea that's been bandied about here that we not approve this article, um, perhaps Mr. Gilligan might throw in a few key choice words about the impact on the town's uh, credit rating, et cetera, if any. Do you feel so uh, moved, Mr. Gilligan? Mr. Gilligan, will this affect our stellar AAA bond rating? <laughs> <laughs> a stiffened contractor. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm making some, a dangerous question here. Other things may affect our AAA bond rating, but this will not. But do you, do you still, uh, do, would you recommend passage? Uh, you know, it, it, it comes down to good faith. Did the town enter into a contract in good faith? Did the arbitrators enter into a contract in good faith? And Arlington, I would take it from my uh, general look, look, uh, observation over being here almost ten, uh, nine years, is it's a town of good faith. Don't always. disagree with you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Deist?
John Dice, Precinct 13. I'd like to once again appeal to your good instincts. I mean, given that we know so little about what went on, you have no idea whether or not it was the triple A or these arbitrators or whatever. Let's just vote the lousy 4,000 or whatever it is, dollars. Thank you very much. Mr. Berkowitz. Thanks. Uh, Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. Uh, I don't think this is a good use of town meeting time. Uh, I think that in the absence of uh, <clears throat> policy to the contrary, we should approve, of course, the $4,000. But I would like to ask Dr. Bodhi if it's possible or if she's able to construct a policy that would prevent such occurrences from happening in the future. Dr. Bodhi, can you write a school department policy that will make that happen in the future? I don't see how she actually could, because, you know, it's a, public <laughs> it's a public contract, and who's yelling back there? They don't have the right to yell. Mr. <laughs> Berkowitz has the floor. Uh, I, again, I would like to ask Dr. Bodie if, Dr. Bode, if please, the school please department can construct a, a uh, contract provisions which would mandate that uh, bills be, invoices be submitted within a certain period of time. What I can do is ask the American Arbitration Association if they could um, <coughs> remind their arbitrators to submit their bills in a more timely fashion. I, uh, I certainly I think, will do that yeah. uh, and actually already have, um, but I will reiterate it to them. The, um, the po any policies that are made vis-a-vis -vis, uh, school committees uh, is, is, is are created and, uh, and passed by the school committee. I can't, I think the only thing that could happen differently would be if we waited longer perhaps to close out the books for a particular year, but that's certainly not the desirable way to handle this. These, these bills were encumbered, it's just that they were submitted after the books had been closed. Well, I'm not sure that um, I can take this up with the Policies and Procedures Committee and get some advice on whether that's possible. Well, based on what I understand, I would suggest that, that you do so and that that would apply not only to the AAA but also to other vendors that submit invoices to the school department because that would prevent such occurrences from happening in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Berkowitz. Mr. Moore? Thank you. Uh, I think this is a simple matter of whether or not we pay our bills. Uh, whether or not I get submitted late, I don't, you know, having been in umpteen million arbitrations, you don't want to have arbitrators not think that you, uh, the town of Arlington is not going to pay their bills when they get submitted. Uh, it is a question of nine-tenths vote, probably not going to happen, but I can assure you, as Mr. Ciano uh, suggested, that if these arbitrators go to court, there's no defense that I'm aware of that will keep them from getting a judgment, and it would be a, a poor waste of our uh, uh, capable town council's time to go down and try to defend a defenseless suit. Let's just vote this and get, a, get on with it. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the Red Sox score? Can't say anything else. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under this article. Second. All in, no, we have a second. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Okay, debate is terminated. Mr. Schlickman will give us a score after the break. Now, <laughs> we're paying prior year's bills with this year's money. It requires a nine-tenths vote by state law. So that means 90% of the people. So all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Uh, standing vote. All in favor of paying last bill, please rise. Ms. Mahan, 11.
Mr. Schlickman? 49, 39. Mr. O'Connor? 47. Mr. Trembley? 47. Mr. McCabe? 31. All opposed, please rise. Zero up front. One on the left. One in the center. Zero on the right center. Mr. McCabe? Eight. That's ten. Um, who would be Stein Pence? That would be a tenth and seventeen. It is approved 175, the positive, ten in the negative. It's 9.30 something. We're going to take a break. Come back in 10 minutes. Thank you. And you have a score. Red Sox are up one nothing. There are 19 seconds remaining in the basketball game. It's tied at 86. Oh.
Okay, we're back in session here. Next up. Warren Article 7 of the Special Town Meeting, Board of Selectmen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to get our um, DPW head, Mike Rademacher, to discuss this article. Thank you. Mr. Rademacher. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Rademacher. I'm the uh, Director of Public Works. And the article here in question is for permission uh, to, for the authority to have uh, easements taken by eminent domain for the Mass Ave Quarter project. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware of this project, the town is working on a design that will reconstruct uh, Mass Ave from Pond Lane to the Cambridge Line, approximately one mile of roadway. And associated with this project will be the reconstruction of sidewalks on either side of the road, so uh, approximately two miles of sidewalk. The sidewalk will be built back in its current uh, location, more or less, and though, so the back sides of the sidewalk will fall on property lines, just on the edge of the road uh, right-of-way and the abutters' properties along Mass Avenue. So it is unlikely that w while you're constructing the sidewalk that you, will, that you would need to, or it is likely that you would need to make some adjustments or regrade or make improvements to people's properties, such as a uh, new lawn or adjusting a, a step uh, or whatnot, which may be uh, adjacent to the sidewalk. Uh, and such, because this project is being funded uh, significantly through federal and state funds, it is required that we have these easements in place so that the town has the permission to enter on private property to make these adjustments or the grading or the seating or the, uh, the, uh, the adjustments to people's steps that may abut the sidewalk again. Uh, the majority of the easements that we would be seeking will be temporary in nature. Again, last just as long as the project and give us the permissions to do this kind of associated work. There are a small number, I believe six, permanent easements that will be required for this project. And those are for instances where we will have rebuilt handicap ramps. In order to meet today's standards for handicap ramps, there are a greater uh, space requirements than in the past. And the areas where these six uh, specific locations are, uh, there is not enough room within the, the layout. So uh, we would need to get a permanent easement to allow us to build the ramps correctly. Uh, in neither case would we be actually taking land from uh, residents or property owners. We would essentially have easements. Again, the temporary easements would be for about a three-year period. The permanent easements would be for as long as we would maintain the handicap ramps that would require that easement. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Mr. Trembley. Ed Trembley, uh, Precinct 19. Um, I got kind of an earful over the weekend about this from one of my neighbors, and, and don't misunderstand me. You know, as, a, as an elected representative, I, it's my responsibility to hear my neighbors and hear what they have to say. But he was dead set against spending any kind of money on this. I mean, the, the, the amount of money that's been proposed, I think, is a little uh, to pay for some of these permanent e easements is kind of a slushy figure. And uh, there's nothing hard and fast there. But he, his, his philosophy was that uh, if the town has the, uh, Mr. Moderator, am I correct in thinking it was uh, $100,000 or $200,000 or something? Mr. Rodemar, could you have a dollar figure on how much this is going to run? The process will require an assessment made of all the easements. Uh, because the nature of the vast majority is our temporary, we don't believe that they will be an absorbent amount. Uh, we are estimating on the low side, or we're, we're, we're assuming about $100,000. That is the price for the actual uh, cost of having the assessment done, and then the cost of the temporary and permanent easements. Uh, 
I believe at one point a statement uh, was made between 100 and 200,000. Again, it was just a, a safety factor there. Well, my neighbor's philosophy was that if the town uh, has a spare hundred or two hundred thousand dollars kicking around for a uh, project that's um, controversial to say the least, that uh, they really don't need the money for a prop two and a half override. Uh, and he was, uh, like I said, I got an earful about this. Um, I had a, another question, Mr. Moderator. Are any of these handicapped ramps that we're talking about, will these be, uh, uh, are these uh, going to stick out in the street? Mr. Ragamaka? I'll, I'll answer, uh, I can add some insight to your first question about the cost of the easements. The state has funding available to the town for the cost of these easements. Uh, uh, with our chapter 90 money so it would not come out of the tax rolls for the easement costs and as far as the uh, the handicap ramps they would be within the sidewalk layout there may be some within what's been called bump outs but I believe the six in question are not included in bump outs they're in areas where because of turning movements or for other reasons they're they're tighter into the uh, the property lines okay um. Well, uh, Mr. Moderator, you can, uh, you can uh, tell me, correct me if this is beyond the scope of the uh, article here. Um, I was going to invite all town meeting members to go take a look at the bump outs out by CVS and observe the chunks of granite that are missing from those, I think they're six month old bump outs. Um, each one of those chunks represents either a broken snowplow or somebody's wrecked car. And, and I don't think we should be building projects that wreck people's, the town residents' property and wreck the town equipment. Um, I, I would plan on voting no on this because I don't, uh, uh, from, for two reasons, hearing my neighbors and, and because I don't think this is uh, uh, a good thing to spend money on. Thank you. you. You want us to go on a field trip right now? What can we do at, the, the, at the termination of town meeting? No, I wouldn't suggest leaving now. No. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Brien. Andy O'Brien, uh, Precinct 16. Um, I'm not going to really speak to the economics of the issues. Um, I read many things online about how um, every billion dollars spent on um, construction projects uh, results in a multiplier of something between 20,000 and 40,000 new jobs. Uh, instead, I'll come up in defense of uh, bricks. Um, just want to, uh, Steve, uh, Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu has suggested that uh, giving roads and roofs a paler color would have the same effect of removing every car in the world off the road for 11 years. According to the yeah, AFP, yeah, this, this is a geo... Scope. What's that? Bricks. We're talking about easements. Easements of sidewalks. Okay, so the, I, I was led... Okay. Uh, then Clarify what your point is. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's within scope. Is this dealing with sidewalks? Yeah, sidewalk easements. Just the easements? Yep. So it has nothing to do with bricks? Not unless they're going to build all these sidewalks out of bricks. <laughs> so out of marker, bricks or concrete? Concrete. concrete. <laughs> okay, so, all right, uh, the other night uh, before town meeting, um, okay, I was under the impression that these sidewalks were going to be made out of bricks and there was some problem with that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'm a little embarrassed to be up here. Okay. Uh, I'll pass. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. Um, Mr. Scott Smith. Uh, Scott Smith, Article um, Scott Smith, uh, Precinct Five. Uh, just want to talk briefly uh, very familiar with the whole project and this article which is focused very specifically on the easements for the sidewalk so you know it's not about number of lanes not about the motorist or cyclist accommodation even with a four-lane road you would still need these easements 
to properly reconstruct the sidewalks. It was about pedestrian accommodation, disabilities accommodation. You heard the frustration of our Disabilities Commission representative last week at our town's slow progress in installing ramps. What this does is gives us the opportunities to do a number of ramps, places where they are substandard at one fell swoop. And this is a big ticket item. Uh, should not pass up this opportunity. And of course, the driveway street interface. That's what this is about. And about, about the sidewalk conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, and my colleague, Adam Oster, took a few of these pictures. I took a few. Uh, some are in fair to good shape, some are in very rough shape uh, by Arlington Diner. Next, please. Uh, ramp, that doesn't meet standards. Next, please. Uh, and some of the patches and driveways pretty worn out. Next. Uh, ramp down at Marathon Street. Uh, next. Uh, see more. These are a few I took, some tripping hazards. There's a hole by Fox Library, uh, substandard ramp. Um, and last slide. Okay, so uh, just to you know, reiterate, easements give us a space we need to proper reconstruction of the sidewalks, enable ramps that meet ADA standards. And one interesting thing is there was some discussion of bump outs earlier. Well, one reason that bump outs sometimes are built is when you have a right of way constraint, you don't have the ability and you need to get some more sidewalk space to build a proper ramp, I think. Now what I notice is the permanent easements tended to be at places where we don't have bump outs. Uh, and, and finally, enables the project to meet our pedestrian and disabilities accommodation goals and should support it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Ruderman. Um. Well, I think you may have gone home. Come on up front. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I'm confused about one thing that I think I might have misheard in passing. Uh, no matter what the design of this project and no matter uh, how it's funded with uh, Chapter 90 uh, funds from the state, I, I believe that the town is responsible for uh, acquiring uh, rights of way, is, is that correct? And by acquiring, meaning, meaning appraisal, appraisal negotiation, payment, payment to the owners, recording the documents, so the registry of deeds, all that? Yes, Mike Rademacher, uh, Director of Public Works. Correct, the project is uh, fully funded through federal and state monies. Uh, what that funding didn't include was property acquisitions, which would include these easements. So the town is responsible for doing all the legwork and paperwork to get these easements. You are correct. We, you, but like all. I said, though, we, the funding we are uh, the, the funding is uh, state funding is eligible to get these easements, just not as part of the original funding package for the program. I'm, I'm sorry, that was the part I didn't understand. State funding is eligible for reimbursing the town? The easements are eligible for state funding. They're eligible for state and, funding. And they will be. I mean, that won't be a problem. We've already had, had that conversation. So okay. we just have to go after it? Correct. Okay. okay. We just got to go after the money. That's all I was misinformed then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connors? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Joe Connors from Precinct 7. I just want to everyone to connect the dots to this particular article. By connecting the dots, I mean that if this article is passing, then the state uh, Department of Transportation can move forward with their plan submitted by the town to create a Mass Ave corridor project. If this article is defeated, then that kills the Mass corridor project. Please connect the dots. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I respectfully disagree with the previous speaker. Let's examine the reasons. One, this is about sidewalk easements. That means that we want to either construct sidewalks on private property 
or we want to be digging around and trespassing or intruding onto private property uh, in the process of constructing these sidewalks. Logically speaking, Mass Ave, the travel portion of the avenue, is not on private property. The only portion that is on private property is the far end of the sidewalk near the property line. If we are constructing handicapped ramps and require the easement, it is in order for the sidewalk to go onto private property, which means that they're not going out into the street, they're going the other way into the private property. The bottom line on this is that the curbs can go in the same place, the avenue can be constructed in the same way. The only thing we get if we defeat this is worse sidewalks. If you want crappy sidewalks, vote no. If you want the sidewalks to be done in conformance to standards and done well, vote yes and give them the room to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Eric Berger, Precinct 6. I urge you to vote no on Article 7. Article 7 is going to authorize the selectmen to acquire hundreds of easements in land necessary, we're told, to improve the sidewalks along Mass Ave and East Arlington. Many of these rights, as we've learned, are going to be temporary easements to facilitate construction. Some are going to be permanent land takings needed, for example, to install wheelchair ramps. These easements are necessary, as has been pointed out, for the completion of the Mass Avenue Carter Project, the $5.8 million dollar uh, roadway project reconstruction that's under review by the Mass Department of Transportation. Now there are two reasons essentially why it would be disastrous to pass this article. First, the selectmen are asking you for a blank check. Though Article 7 is vague, the selectmen have reported to town meeting they're going to be seeking easements for 226 temporary situations, six permanent easements, from property owners along Mass Ave. And what they haven't told us is what's the cost going to be. Now we have an estimate from the Department of Public Works it's going to be between $100,000 and $200,000. Not a small sum, but it's a reckless throw of the dice. We don't know how much this is going to cost. Now we don't know the anticipated cost, for example, of each easement or how that's going to be determined exactly. We don't know the legal cost the town may occur, incur if property owners resist this and say we're not going to give you uh, the eminent domain that you're uh, requesting because we don't want to do it. So we'll go to court. All right, we'll go to court. Therefore, a vote for Article 7 is a vote to give the selectmen, I maintain, unlimited and open-ended authority to purchase property and seek loans. And I maintain it's a Pandora's box that we shouldn't open in these economic times. It's going to be fiscally irresponsible of us to allow the select to take on such a potentially costly endeavor when there's no limit to our financial exposure. We don't know the end game. Voters expect us to know exactly what we're voting on, especially if it has to do with their money. And we don't know the, the answer. Secondly, the selectmen are asking for money now to improve sidewalks is like a person who can't pay his mortgage and he's going to put a pool in the backyard. I mean, it's an understatement to say things are tight now. We're in a fiscal tight situation. We're facing a substantial budget deficit. We're being told the, sele we're being told the selectmen cannot um, finance the basics, for example, with our schools, for our kids. We're up against it. Next month we're going to be asking the residents, a lot of whom are up against it, to approve a $6.5 million tax override so we can fund the basics like education for our kids. Now in light of these circumstances, I'm telling you, it's fiscally irresponsible to ask you to open up the town's coffers to pay off property owners along Mass Ave to make roadway improvements. This is not the time to be spending money to improve anything. We're up against the wall. As a community, 
we need to keep our financial resources focused on the basics. Now, the selectmen will tell you that while the town needs to pay for the easements, the actual sidewalk improvements themselves, which is true, are going to be paid for by state and federal funds coming out of the Mass Ave project. Now, that is true, but the worst shocker of all is this, and really the most irresponsible part is this, that the Article 7 authorizes the selectmen now to pay for the easements, to buy the property now, to go to court perhaps in eminent domain now, before the project is approved. The project is far from a done deal. You may have heard or witnessed yourself that hundreds of Arlington residents packed this place. I mean, you couldn't get an empty, you couldn't find a seat. The balcony was full. There was standing room only. There were hundreds of people here, many of them expressing uh, visceral opposition to the project. Now, the point is, the DOT witnessed this widespread opposition. And for all we know, they may decide not to fund the project. Maybe the, the DOT will decide to fund some other project in another town with a widespread common ground support for the project. And if that's the case, and there's no money to pay for the sidewalk improvements because the project didn't get funded, what good are the easements? Furthermore, a lawsuit could stop the Carter project dead in its truck. Thank you. Please. Thank you. You have to speak right into the mic. All right. Thank you very much. Furthermore, a lawsuit could stop the Carter Project dead in its tracks. Now, the selectmen, I maintain, are asking you to, to take an irresponsible leap of faith here. It's awfully premature. If you vote for Article 7 and the Carter Project is not approved, you're going to be part of this mess. You'll have authorized the purchase of easements and property that can't be used because the money to improve the sidewalks is not coming from the state and federal government because the project got turned down. Now, how are you going to explain that to your constituents, that you put the cart before the horse? I mean, somebody comes up to you and says, what did you spend the money for? Do you know we're up against it? How, how could you gamble it? You didn't know for sure that the project was going to be approved, but you spent the money. I think it would be far more prudent, at least, to wait until we're certain that the, uh, the Carter project is a done deal before asking the town meeting members here to spend our constituents' money to secure easements. Uh, to, to obtain some information uh, needed to, I, I say, for us to intelligently vote on this so we understand the financial implications. First of all, I have a, a question for the... I have a question, thank you, for the selectmen or uh, uh, the gentleman from the, uh, from the uh, Department of Public Works. How many parcels or pieces of property are going to be involved under the authorization? Uh, how many, please? How many total pieces of property? Yes. Are being purchased? Will be involved, yes. Will be not, involved. Not necessarily will be involved, right. Not necessarily purchased. Uh, there are uh, currently 230 temporary easements and six permanent easements proposed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how many? Just Mike another Rod question, please. Yep. Uh, how many? Record? I'm sorry. Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I thank you, Mike. Uh, how many are going to be acquired, do you know, by eminent domain or purchase? Well, we, it, until we get into the, they would all be essentially, potentially could be by eminent domain and depending on the, um, how the process goes as we're, as we're reaching out to residents okay, or what, property owners. What uh, town budget is the money going to come from? It's going to come from state funds. Have you gotten that in writing? We did. We asked the state and they said the money that is available to the town is eligible for property acquisition. So that there's going to be a separate uh, uh, grant or a separate Correct. Grant? It's, a separate, uh, it's a separate pool of money from this project. Are you going to need to borrow any money? No. You're not. Okay. Uh, how much money has been allocated for the legal costs? The, we haven't. Our town council would handle most of that. Have you, have you allocated any money for that? No. Not that I'm aware of. The council could answer that better than I. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rice, has any money been allocated to your office? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town <coughs> Council. You all already pay me, so I guess it has, but not in connection with this project. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to vote no. I say this is not the right time to approve this project because of the fiscal situation that we're in the town. So I'm going to vote no on this, and I ask you to also. Thank you, sir. Mr. McKinney? For what purpose do you rise? 
Point of water. What's your point of order, sir? What do you, what do you want to do? I'd like to know what we're discussing. Uh, I, know, I know we're talking about Article 7, and under my report it says uh, the selectmen will report. They have reported, but I don't have a, uh, a recommended vote, and unless we have a recommended vote, then uh, we're wasting our time. Now, I'm being shown an article in the annual town meeting warrant, but we're not in the annual town meeting. We're in the special town meeting. Miss, miss, so, um, Mr. Moderator, what is the recommended vote I'm that we're talking about so that we can see precisely what we're voting? Mr. McCabe, and unless we have I it in have writing, an I suggest that we put this off I have an answer for, for another you. meeting. We have an answer. Ms. Rowe, can you tell him that, that the recommended vote is same as 58, correct? Yes. The recommended vote is on page 26 and 27 of this booklet. Mr. Moderator, that is the report for the annual town it's, meeting. It's We're for, not um, in the annual I'm town sorry. meeting. I'm sorry. Mr. The same vote for Article 58 as Article, is is Article 7. It has the same Article 58 slash special town meeting Article 7. Is that a, a acceptable to you, Mr. Moderator? Yes, it is, sir. Thank you very much. So does everybody else understand that too? It's a legit question. Article 58 is also recommended vote is also the recommended vote for Article 7. So Article 50. I asked you, Mr. Judd, not to be yelling. Stop it. Now, Article 58 of the annual town meeting is the same recommended vote for Article 7 of the special. I have it in front of me. It's right there. There it is. It's the same. And then they have their amendment, which is all these, this really tiny print that I, for the life of me, can't read. It is grids and grids of all the properties. Every single one of them is listed. That was in their supplemental report, I believe. Is that clear, Mr. McCabe? All right, can, can you tell us where that is? In the very back of this yeah. report, are about one, two, three, four, eight pages, ten pages of all the easements that we'd be asking for, both permanent and temporary. Okay. Um, Mr. Streifeld? Mark Streitfeld, Precinct 20. Um, I was listening to the discussions here and I'm going to ask some questions that I believe are rhetorical, um, but I'm going to ask them anyway and I, I guess they go beyond rhetorical because I'm asking questions. This article in absolutely no way appropriates any money, is that correct, Mr. Moderator? No, it is, um, wait a second. The recommended vote under Article 58 slash 7 does not appropriate money. Okay, and there's no way that the town is going to be obligated for any expenses under this. That is correct? That's how I'm reading it. Okay, and... I got um, you, Mr. McKinney. Oh, the, the, the clocky. Sorry. And there is... Uh, and, and whether this is passed or not, I read in this extra handout that was distributed sometime that what happens if the town meeting votes no, and it says the town meeting uh, may seek to resign the project or eliminate or minimize sidewalk reconstruction. Some sidewalks will not get replaced. The town would investigate replacing a portion of the sidewalks in a way that would not require easements. So there is absolutely no way that this vote is going to affect whether or not the Mass Ave quarter project goes through, correct? I don't, I don't know what you have in your hand, uh, but, oh, the one that wasn't signed. Yes, yeah, so we're all supposed to ignore because it, it wasn't signed. But if that's what it says, I'm going to believe you. Okay. This document will speak for itself, so whoever puts stuff out should actually sign it from now on. 
There's also a map that was never signed. So, so go ahead. So, so, so the Mass Ave Quarter project is going to continue on as is, regardless of what gets passed here. Uh, uh, and the only effect will be that, according to this, the sidewalks replacement will have to be done some other way. Um, and I, I bring this up because some people have linked the two together, but if the Mass Ave quarter project doesn't get done, then I hope you can answer uh, will that have a financial impact on the town, or is that too far off topic? Mr. Tosti. Could you just repeat that question again, please? So, some people have suggested that if we don't pass this, the Mass Ave Quarter project won't get done, and that would fin be financially better off be, or that will leave the town financially better off. Well, if you like tripping over sidewalks, uh, I think that the, uh, at some point, drive down East Arlington, walk on the sidewalks. Uh, they're in horrible condition. Address uh, his question, please. So but, but, but it won't affect we'll the finances have, of the town. We'll have to do the work sometime. Okay, and then if we have to do the work sometime, then we'll have to pay for that. And oh, if we do it now, it gets paid for by the state. Therefore, That's if we, if it didn't get done, oh, okay. So this article, despite what some of the folks who have been opposing it have said, does not in any way uh, affect going ahead of the Mass Ave corridor project, and it does not save the town any money. Uh, makes all the sense in the world to vote yes, because it's in our best interest. Okay, thank you. And to address Mr. McCabe again, on page 26 of the Selectman Report, the very bottom, it says Article 58, Special Town Meeting, Article 7, voted. That's what we're voting on. So you all should have that on page 26 of your blue book, along with the teeny tiny grids. Mr. Uh, McKinney. I got mine. Lawrence McKinney, 7th Precinct, home of the disgusting sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> and the useless Uncle Sam committee. And, well, anyway, my question is, and I have not heard any definitive answer, and I, that's all I'm here for. Some people say maybe it will stop or maybe it won't stop. Who here can give us a definitive answer? If we vote this down, could this affect the DOT to the extent that they would not go through with the project? In other words, could this be the stick in the spokes that stops it? And I haven't heard a definitive answer yet. Ah, Ms. Rowe is going to give us a... It's my opinion that this would not stop it. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to hear. You can't get much higher than the, than the Chief Selectman. Thank you. Ms. Romano? That's chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Maria Romano, Precinct 7. Actually, the easements, the reworking of the sidewalks are absolutely essential. We want to meet handicap standards. To say that one has nothing to do with the other is not true. First of all, you can't do the easements in the proper way until the Mass Ave project is approved because you might put the handicap accessible ramps in the wrong place depending on the final plan that is accepted. So when we speak of not putting the cart before the horse or the horse whatever it is, it's true. We want the funding just as we want the funding for Mass Ave. We're not going to lose the funding 90 if we get on the list. We're not going to lose the Mass Ave money if we get on the list. We're not on either list, as far as I could see. We're going to ask for the money. But they are very much tied in. And I think the answer is, before we take people's property, 
either willingly or by eminent domain, we better find out what the Mass Ave project is going to look like at the end, and then we do it. Thank you. There was no real question. Uh, there wasn't a real question there. Yeah. Um, Mr. Oster. Adam Oster, uh, Precinct 3. This is my part of town, too. Um, Mr. Moderator, I have a recollection, a vague recollection, that we have done something like this not too long ago. Uh, can you refresh my memory? Last year, we took easements up by the Dallin School to make nice sidewalks for the kids. Is that true, Mr. Rademacher? Yeah. Is that what you're referring to, sir? I, I think so. Yes. I mean, my impression is this is a kind of routine thing that we do when we do sidewalks because you need to do this when you do sidewalks. Um, uh, did the selectmen have a vote on this? Yes. What Page was the vote? 26 of your blue book down the bottom. And at 27 on the top, it continues, yes. See, it says Article 58, Annual Special Town Meeting, Article 7. So instead of printing it twice, they printed it once and saved us paper. Uh, I see there that it says that this is conditional on conformance with plans as approved at 25% by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Highway Division. Uh, and goes on from there. The way that I read that, and if anyone understands differently, I'd like to hear from them, is that uh, uh, it's contingent on that approval, so there's no danger uh, those people who actually are concerned that we would go ahead and start you know, taking land and taking easements uh, before the approval came through. There's no danger of that happening, is there? Um, Ms. Rowe, is there a danger of that happening? time spent on something that is not going to go forward. This is a, one of the things, that, this is a very traditional way of timing the easements. The easements come at this point in time because the easement process takes quite a long time. You have to find out if people are willing to donate their temporary easements or whether they want to be paid for them. It's very time consuming as, as Mike can tell you. And the reason that we're starting this now is to start the process. The design is not finished. So we don't have the final exact permanent easements or temporary easements. It's, it's to start a process, and that's, that's the reason for it. Uh, Mr. Moderator, it seems to me that there's a kind of an irony here. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of controversy about the design of the project, but it sounds like should town meeting withhold this authority from this particular project because of its association with this design, that the result would be that the design would go through and that uh, 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 the road would be completely rebuilt and in fact bicycles would have a first class accommodation as a result, but pedestrians would not. And uh, that's not fair uh, to those of us who live in the neighborhood. Uh, it's really not fair to people who are uh, in wheelchairs and using walkers and have to get around. Um, and it's also unfair to put uh, businesses through the agony of construction, which is going to be considerable, and then say to them, oh, but the sidewalks that people use to get to your front door, second class job. So I'm going to ask town meeting, uh, including the opponents of this project, to seriously consider letting the sidewalks get fixed because they're in rough shape and they really need it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Peter Fiore. Oops, I meant to call Elsie. If you're increasing too, and it's curious if the selectmen or the EPW uh, spoke with any of these abutters and got any kind of preliminary idea if they're going to just hand over the easements or they're going to expect to be compensated. I'm just curious. That's a lot of easements. Have you done any kind of straw poll? Yeah. Mr. Rodemacher, have any of the neighbors or about has been contacted yet? 
Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, we have not started to uh, reach out to abutters yet. In this manner, for, for, for easements. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Elsie Fiore. Elsie Fiore, Precinct 2. I put this article in the same class as Article 51 that we just spent a night and a half on. There is a lot of confusion. And uh, I do see that on uh, the, the uh, comment that the, under Article 58, says that these uh, rights and things do need to be taken in order to conform to the public works project. Now they don't say, are there other goals? Now they don't say necessarily that it's the whole thing going down Mass Avenue. But it says a previous speaker just said, this whole thing is the benefit of bicycle riders because there's not enough room on our bike path for bike riders. And the bike riders want to tell us that they are very safe. Yep. What's your point of order, Mr. Smith? Be able to see the relevance of this to the easements on the sidewalks? Yeah. They're questioning your scope of the bicycles and the easements of the sidewalks. Can you explain? Uh, well, I only know that there are, I, I guess that I, I probably made a mistake in, in uh, going into the discussion of the uh, project itself, but it seems to me it's mentioned in these articles, which are confusing because they're in two books, and it said, um, the Arlington uh, Board of Selectmen uh, we're going to report on this and uh, in Article 7 of the special town meeting in the original article that's in this thing it says that the, re uh, the replacement of the sidewalks is in connection with the Commonwealth's Transportation Improvement Program which includes widening the sidewalks uh, so people can, the businesses can have dining out on the sidewalks. And that's, that's not in the Article 7 warrant, Ms. Fiore. <coughs> Article 7 warrant, as printed in the warrant, just talks about acquiring outright or acquiring permanent temporary easements along Mass Ave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It talks nothing about sidewalks and dining and anything like that. That's in the big old plan that hasn't been approved yet. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm going to put it back uh, in that it's in the same confusing uh, place that we were on Article 51. And uh, what I would like to know is uh, the, somebody is very busy putting in uh, handicap slope ramps on all the st uh, streets down around where I am, down Mott Street, Mary Street, uh, Mass uh, Lake Street. Who's paying for all of that? And uh, we didn't have that come before us to vote. Mr. So Robert, it seems to me they're so tied together that I would like uh, the article to be voted down until we have better information. I'm sorry if I've confused more people uh, than I should have. Thank you. Mr. Rademacher, who's paying for the ramps down in the girl streets? Uh, that ramp uh, project is being paid for uh, through a, a grant received by the Disabilities Commission. Okay, okay. Mr. Grant Cook. <coughs> Grant Cook, Precinct 6. Um, my credibility on this issue, actually, I live on Orvis, uh, which is kind of just a little bit up off Lake Street, and I look out every morning to see cars backed up on my street. Um, trying to cut through the Lake Street intersection to avoid having to wait. Um, and on the weekends, I look out my front window to see cars speeding by at 40 miles an hour trying to avoid the intersection. And as I look over to my newborn son and realize he'll be playing out there one day, um, I'm deeply troubled by how this is being handled. I, I know the initial justification for the project and the easements and everything around it was tied to, tied to safety. And, and I worry that, at least in my perspective, the cut through traffic safety issue hasn't well, been addressed. But it probably is out too. of scope. Yeah, let's keep both in the scope. But let's look at the proponent, let's look at the, the issues here around this. I mean, there's a group of people who are, who are 
vehemently in support of this, which is the town selecting behind me. They're, they want this money like I want chicken wings on game day. I mean, it's free money. What the heck? You get this, that area will have to be rehabilitated. And they would paint the road pink and name it the Idi Amin Thruway if it meant the state would give them free money for this. I mean, it's no. Do you think they, wouldn't, they don't want this money and would do whatever's necessary to get it? They do. They do. There are those of us who are against it, you know, for reasons of, of, of a lot of variety. And there are those of us who are for it. The price is a bike lane. But don't get up here and say this is an issue of inconsequence, that you have to vote for this because it, it just makes sense. It'll make the construction easier. I mean, Captain Ahab didn't give Moby Dick some accommodation because it made things easier for the boat. If you're against it, you vote against something. You don't support it. And for those of, the, those of us who are saying no to this, saying no to this is one way, another way of getting our voice out there, that we do not approve of how this is being handled. This is too divisive an issue to go forward. So, thank you. Mr. Logan. Logan, Precinct 2. I have a question for the Department of Public Works. Hey, address the question to me. I'll get who the right person is. Uh, yes. Uh, the sidewalks, the, the ones that, were, that are being put in now, are they going to be wider? Are you going to be changing the width of the sidewalks, Mr. Rademacher? Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, there has been uh, many iterations on the sidewalks and their widths. Uh, for the most part, they will remain the same width. There will be some areas that will be wider um, and some that may even be narrower, but I don't believe there's going to be a drastic change in the uh, width of the sidewalks in the proposed project. And why are they going to be wider in those areas? Uh, some areas, for instance, uh, in front of the Capitol Theater, it was determined that because there was a bus stop there and there was many folks needed a sidewalk, I believe we were able to find some space for a sidewalk there, for, for example. Now, the ramps, that, getting back to you mentioned, uh, someone else mentioned, I believe it was Elsie, about the uh, ramps that were put in, in the Lake Street area. Are those ramps ADA, uh, are they fit in with the ADA guidelines? The, uh, the ramps being built currently today? I'm yes, in like the Mary Street, Lake Street area. I'm yeah. going to allow an answer to that question, but that's really off scope of the Mass Ave easements that we're talking about. Well, you already told in. us, I mean, you're asking if the current ramps being built in other part of the town are ADA compliant. Of course they're ADA compliant. Why else would we build them? Okay. But you can answer the question, Mr. Rademacher. So uh, let me rephrase my question so it's more. But, but let's keep the, it within the scope of the warrant. Are those article. the same types of ramps that are going to be built on Mass Ave? The ramps will take different configurations. They depend, no matter how they're built or what configuration, there are certain slopes, widths, and dimensions that have to be met, and, and they will be met. Now, you said there'd also be about two, over 200 temporary easements, right? Correct. Okay. And did you need that many easements for the Lake Street area or that area? N no. Th this is a, a scope, much Mr. Logan. greater scope. Okay. Project. I just want to point that out so I don't feel that we need all these easements. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I just want to point out that uh, there really isn't anything confusing about this project, despite the fact that you know, some of the opponents of this project would like you to think this is a very confusing subject. It's straightforward. I think we all agree, uh, particularly the people in East Arlington, that the sidewalks in that area need to be replaced. The state is willing to step up and pay approximately a million dollars to replace those sidewalks for us. We have to get these temporary easements and six permanent easements in order to make that happen. It's not unusual on construction projects. It's required for all federal and state projects. When we do local projects, we don't bother going through that formal process. We just talk to the homeowner. We may have to step on your property when we're doing the sidewalk is our right to enter your property. But it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, in obtaining these easements, as you heard already, this, we have state funds already available to cover the cost of acquiring these easements. Um, and I think we owe it to the taxpayers. If this work has to be done, and I think we all agree, why turn down the million dollars to have these sidewalks replaced? If we turn it down, as you heard earlier, um, okay, we'll leave the sidewalks as is and we'll just go ahead with the roadway project. Uh, but I don't think that's doing a service to the people in East Arlington to leave the sidewalks in that condition. And it's going to be a bill that the taxpayers in this community are going to have to pay because those sidewalks will have to be replaced eventually. 
Thank you, Mr. Jamison. Gordon Jamison, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Is it on? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Uh, what Mr. Sullivan very eloquently stated was that if we don't take the money for the sidewalks in East Arlington, we will have to pay for it out of our own pockets. Um, what one previous speaker suggested was that if we take the $5.1 million and take and put we, that we could potentially put it in the town coffers. That is false, as I understand it from the discussion that has come. We cannot take that money and re-stick it in our coffers to help our financial situation. Our financial situation is what it is. This project is something completely different financially. Mr. Redermacher, or Mr. Sullivan mentioned that uh, when we do local construction, we don't have to have easements. When I first moved into the town, they had redone the uh, water and sewer drains on my street, and they came by later and uh, did the sidewalk, which is very nice. Nice to have a new sidewalk in front of your store or house or business. Um, someone talked about the money. I've heard several times, repeatedly, that this is not going to cost us anything, that the state is going to reimburse us for this. The state reimburses for lots of things. We have special education costs. We get reimbursed the next year. We don't ask for a mandate in front of town meeting that that process is going to happen. Um, someone mentioned we're spending money without an appropriation. We're not. We're getting reimbursed. Someone, we've been talking a lot about permanent and temporary easements. And as noted by Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Redemacher, these are required to get the funds that are going to do the sidewalks and do the Mass Ave project if it's approved by the state. We've talked about permanent and temporary. These are easements. Easements, if, um, and perhaps Ms. Rice can further clarify, easements are different than taking land. If you look on the far right corner here, there's a, there's a column called total taken, square feet. That's the land the town takes from someone. I only see zeros. What this means is someone is going to build a sidewalk. I don't see anything but zeros. Correct me if I'm wrong, someone. But no one's land is going to be taken. They're going to build a sidewalk and go away, or they're going to build a sidewalk that has a little bit on your property. Now, on the ones that are permanent, I see square foot, 23, number one. Square foot, 34. Square foot, 36. And I think I got one more here somewhere. I might have missed one, but you get the general idea. We're talking three by 10 feet or a foot by 20 feet. This is not like, you know, great encroachment on someone's land. And they get a nice new sidewalk that they can walk on or their kids can ride their bicycles on. And when they go to the ramp, they can roll their bike or their scooter or their walker up and down safely. So I think this is a great idea and we should support it. Thank you. Mr. Fisher. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Bayer. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13, move the question on all matters within this article. What, Mr. Judd? Point to your eyes. While well, you're trying to find the mic, can we take our vote? My point of order is, how can we spend money without appropriating it? There's no, this, Mr. Judd, ex excuse may me. I answer your question? There's no appropriation in this article. It says that the Board of Selectmen be and hereby is authorized to acquire by feminine domain, purchase, or otherwise interest. That sounds to me like money. I don't see a dollar figure. We, we're That's not spending money. Sir, you didn't get called. I'm sorry. Juliana, are we spending a penny? I'm going to entertain you because otherwise you're not going to shut up. <laughs> Please, answer your question. Are we spending a penny under this article? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. There's no appropriation requested. The um, expenses would be paid out of Chapter 90 money, as Mr. Rademacher has already said, that is separately appropriated. Okay, thank you. Now we have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. 
Debate is terminated. Do we need a two-third vote on this because we're acquiring property? Yes. Yes. Okay. All in favor of Article 7 recommended vote is printed in the booklet. Please say yes. Yes. Opposed say no. No. Okay. We're going to have a standing vote because it's two-thirds because we're acquiring property. All in favor of the recommended vote, please rise. Up front, yes, you may, sir. Ten up front. Mr. Schlickman. Twenty-two. Twenty-two on the left. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. Mr. Mr. Um, Trembley. Thirty-six. Mr. McCabe. Thirty-three. All opposed to the recommended vote, please rise. Zero up front. Mr. Trembley. Nine. Mr. Schlickman. Seven. Seven. Mr. O'Connor. Five. Mr. McCabe. Eleven. It votes in the affirmative, 135 to 32. 32, approved. Okay, the special town meeting is, um, we've run out of things to do, so we're now in recess. Um, we are now gonna go, I believe, the next back to the beginning and start again to number 18, It'll be the next one. Mr. Judd, I'm gonna give you fair warning if you have any more outbursts, you stand up and you divide this chair, I'll have you removed from the hall. I spoke to you in private and now I've spoken to you twice, at least in this meeting. I appreciate your compliance with our rules of the quorum as pointed out in the booklet. If you don't have one, we can get you one. Please, I don't have to want to speak to you again. It's disruptive of the meeting and those around you and everyone in general. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe, number Article 18 of the Annual Town Meeting. 17, I think, is postponed to the 11th by my count. Yes. Yes, yes we're um, back to portable storage containers or pods. That, yeah, that, that mic's not working too well. Okay. We're back to... Um, Portable storage containers or pods. I rise to tell you that the Board of Selectmen have voted the fees for both pods and dumpsters, and they are $24. Okay, when we had postponed last, we were confused about what the fees were, and we've now been told that they're $24. Um, I don't, do we have to? No. Um, we're talking about pods and licensing them to sit on the streets, not on public property. Strictly on the streets and the byways of the town. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, you are next on the list. You are next on the list. Did you want to talk about pods? Do you still want to talk about them? Pass. <laughs> Mr. Jameson, do you want to talk about pods? No. Uh, there was some guy, the white shirt in the third row. Uh, Mr. Butler. I, uh, Mr. Chappett. Do you want to talk about pods? No? Mr. Deist. Oh, someone moved the question. Ms. LaCourt. Do you want to talk about pods? Ann LaCourt, Precinct 15. Move the question. 
Thank you. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor of termination of debate, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. Okay, we have, it is an affirmative vote, and I so we declare. Yes, sir. We do have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. It has not changed. Um, yeah, it's in your votes. Article 18 is printed in their report. Um, they had a motion to amend, which deleted some words, and we've been told in the meantime that the, the fine is 25 bucks or the fee is $24 or something. So, all in favor of termination of debate, oh, we just did that. So we have before us the, we had a motion to amend by the selectmen to amend their own vote, which deleted some words. You should all have that in front of you. We have that? It was on this color paper, yellow. It's been on the chairs for, since the 27th. Basically, it's the same one, except it got rid of sentence B. Same as printed in the report, except it got rid of sentence B. Yes, Ms. Fury, what purpose do you rise? We terminated debate. We terminated debate. Well, we, we, we've terminated the debate on all issues before us. We're now just figuring out what we're voting on. On your chairs, the yellow motion to amend. Yep, they gave it to me. Was this given to everybody, Ms. Rowe? Yes. Uh, Marika Prelka says it was. On the 27th, put in your chairs with a motion to amend, which was made and seconded. All it did was change from the recommended vote, got rid of subsection B. And that's all it did. Correct? Well, you, you should. It was put on your chairs. <laughs> Ms. Kropelka told me it was. I believe her. What do you want, Ms. Phelps? May I help you? What point do you rise? Yep. I agree with you, Ms. Phelps. All right, so the recommended vote is as printed in the motion to amend is the recommended vote deleting the subsection B. All in favor of the amended motion, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's so, so, sub, so amended. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is approved as amended. That next would bring us to Article 21. Mr. O'Connor, do you wish to speak to that? Then Mr. Tosti. Thank you, sir. Oops. You got it. Yeah. James O'Connor, Precinct 21. Uh, geez, I'll get the precinct right pretty quick. Jim. Precinct 19. Jim. Yeah, Mike, oh, uh, Mr. O'Connor, can you use the left or right mic? That center mic doesn't seem to be functioning. Mr. O. James O'Connor, Precinct. 19. I rise before you tonight not from Precinct 19 but as a member of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee. We were called upon in the uh, Town Meeting three years ago, 2007, to come together to discuss various procedures that might benefit Town Meeting and attract new members, make appearance in town meeting um, more alluring to those in the town. Um, back in 2008, there was an article before town meeting. This article just here, was Article 17. Article 17, the Board of Selectmen chose to vote no action 
and in Article 17 at the time, the board made no recommendation under the article. They further stated the board's policy with respect to the annual town meeting warrant is that the board shall endeavor, subject to extenuating circumstances, that the warrant for the annual town meeting be open not later than the first week of December, nor be closed earlier than the third full week of January. Further, they stated, the board will not depart from this policy without prior consultation with the town meeting procedures committee. So I submit to you tonight, since the board of selectmen voted um, basically no recommendation because the vote was two to two, that there's a substitute article. For those of you who don't have a copy of this, it's up here, and it was presented to your seats last week, the week before. Um, what I looked at was the prior four years, 1998, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011, and looked at the history of how this warrant has been open. In the first year in question, Mr. Marr, our town council emeritus presented to the board on a meeting that was held on uh, let's see um, twelve three two thousand seven that they make sure that they present to the paper a legal notice for the warrant to be open on December seventeenth at 8 a.m. and remain opened until 12 noon on June, January 11th. Because that affected the amount of time that the townspeople have entitlement to present a warrant article, the Town Meeting Procedures Committee presented this warrant article was heard in 2008. The Board of Selectmen saw fit to endeavor an agreement that they would abide by a plan and come to the town meeting procedures committee if there were going to be a change. The town meeting procedures committee this year met in January and we discussed the problem that at a December meeting on December the uh, excuse me on 11-29 of 2010 Mr. Greeley proposed that the 2011 warrant be open on December 7th and close on January 7th. That didn't fit with the Town Meeting Procedures Committee, nor did it fit with the promise made by the Board of Selectmen. So you may or may not hear from the Board tonight that there's a difficulty in trying to meet the demands of all of the hearings that may or may not be held in compliance with the various boards and committees that have to review the warrant. But it was interesting that as your assistant town moderator, I'm part of the statewide um, blog of moderators where this very issue about the time being open for a warrant was addressed just this weekend. Many of the moderators discussed the issues before them and the townspeople have had some concerns as was heard tonight about maybe the boards not being interested in serving the people as much as they could by having warrants open less time than allowable. Under state law, the town warrant for the town meeting is for the townspeople, you and I as individual residents, to vote um, or to request that considerations be made at town meeting. When we discuss this, we discuss the possible dates as the town meeting procedures committee as to what would be the appropriate start date. It was already agreed upon by the board that it would be the first week of December. We remained with that. What I've heard recently was just last week we talked about how the town manager requested that all of the boards meet, not the boards, but the town departments come together with a balanced budget to be given to him. One of the things that the Finance Committee has discussed is that it's an arduous task to review all of the finance articles. 
If we have now a procedure where the town departments present to the manager a consolidated report of a balanced budget, and he can then submit that to the Finance Committee, this may alleviate some of the burden, although Mr. Tosti may address that later in this discussion. We also heard that a lot of the boards get together monthly and meet and can discuss, as has happened many a time when the Board of Selectmen have decided to present a warrant article that they've met in the months of December and January and discuss the merits of their proposal before it's ever published in the warrant. If we start the debate early enough, we enable these matters to be heard early on so that the townspeople articles, the 10 registered voter articles, the articles for the people that are not specifically represented here have a chance to express their opinion. So I ask you to consider that this be the um, motion before us. So I ask for a second for... Seconded. And I uh, <clears throat> firmly believe that this is something that the Town Meeting Procedures Committee um, put together so that we can have an open meeting for the public. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion to adjourn. Before we take the vote, I'm going to call for any motions for reconsideration on either the special or the annual town meeting. I already have Mr. Rudiman's. I have Mr. Tosti's, who's serving notice on specials two, three, and six. Any other notices for reconsideration? He, seeing and hearing none, all in favor of adjournment, please say yes. yes. Opposed? We're so adjourned till Wednesday. <laughs>